Well, Kai, welcome and thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you very much. It, uh, it's, it's an honor and a pleasure really to, uh, you know, be on, on platforms like this and, you know, to see what we're about to talk about. So it's great. Yeah, no, excited to, to dig in a little bit. And we are going to talk about kind of giving back and what all yeah. that means. And so we should probably start on the pitch first. Um, yeah. So MLS is back and I'm just curious kind of how you're feeling. Must be mixed feelings with the pandemic hanging over it all and getting back in and say, yeah, how's that all been? Yeah, it's it's weird, obviously, the way you say MLS is back because that's why I see everybody <laughs> putting on, uh, you know, all the hashtags and all MLS is back. I'm like, I looked it up the other day where when I was going for first training yesterday, and I was like, when was the last time we were at the stadium for a full thing? And the last game was yeah. on the 7th of April I was like whoa three months complete yeah. you know like even your off seasons you don't take that long without actually playing soccer with the rest of the guys but you know it's nice to be back and know this you know the pandemic is still not in full control but uh for us to say we can get back to training I I think it's a good thing you know it's one of those where they're monitoring us really you know well um doing testing every couple days Okay. So I, a lot of guys complain about their nose, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. you got to do what you have to do to make sure that, you know, we're still in the field playing. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, and obviously kind of your path wasn't a conventional one to the pro game. And so I'd love to, like, I'd love to get into that a little bit, like with everything we do at Ascent Soccer. And yeah. so we have kids that are in North America now from Malawi, Uganda and Kenya. So maybe looking back, like what, what did you learn most in that kind of transition? from Sierra oh, Leone to the U.S. Yeah, wow. It's, uh, it's been so long, but then, you know, uh, you definitely, I do have the, the, the snapshots of pictures in my head over and over. Uh, it's, it's amazing to be, you know, an African kid to have the opportunity to come to these parts of the world, North America, period, Canada, or the U.S., and to be able to go to school because... Yeah. It's just amazing. Uh, I, I didn't come to America. I was, uh, I was 16 years old, and I did not move to the U.S. to actually play soccer. I just moved to the U.S. because my mom left when I was four years old. Um, she left and moved to the U.S., but then the Civil War broke out in Sierra Leone. And through that, there was yeah, 12 years of Civil War. And luckily, again, I was 16. Then I ended up, you know, be able to make my way out as a refugee in a refugee program to uh, move to the U.S. And it was just a blessing. I mean, you're a kid, you're young, you're so excited. It's like, you're going to America, you're going to America. You yeah. know, these things are, are not, you know, memories that will ever be taken away from you. So just super excited to move to this part of the world. I joined my mom, you know, and I started going to school. I started going to school. I didn't really you know, look at soccer to think, yeah, I'm still going to play pro. Even though coming back from Africa, everybody thinks, hey, you, you're going to be out there. You're going to be the best player. You're going to ball them all. I'm like, yeah. uh, you know, but uh, in school, the reason why I really did end up uh, 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 banking on soccer, literally banking, is yeah. because of I couldn't afford to pay for school. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom couldn't afford to pay for school. She was working, you know, a minimum wage job um, as a waitress. And when I told her that I wanted to go to college, she says, well, there's a community college around the corner and you can go there, but I don't have money. But good thing at this moment, I was still, you know, getting good grades. So I walked into the financial aid office once. Um, the advisors, actually, I should say, our school advisors, our counselors. And I asked them, I was like, what do I need to go to college? And they said, well, if you can maintain a 2.5 GPA, you take these tests and then you pass it then you'll be able to go. So they checked my GPAs and it was good. So mm -hmm. I was like, great, I just got to keep this up. And I started making recruiting myself, sending letters to uh, college coaches and say, mm -hmm. hey, uh, I play soccer at this school. Can you come watch me play? <laughs> yeah. You know, but all that, yeah, that was, you know, going through all those process and I just got lucky, to be honest. Yeah, well, I know. And we, we learned that everything we're doing in this time we're spending with our kids too a lot of it is it's about timing and about getting lucky and yeah. it's about being out there enough to get lucky right yeah um, no def definitely to be in the pro game or even in sports or in life really yeah it's about being lucky right place at the right time sure. and you know if you're not lucky don't mean you stop working because the work that you put in during all that time to to get to where you want to get to you're going to meet 
so many people along the way, or you're going to learn so many lessons along the way that ends up staying with you and helps you grow as a person, not just as an athlete, you know? For sure. Yeah. And so on that, like on the lessons, obviously you're a very different man now than you were as a rookie in Columbus. What are, how do you think you've changed the most and kind of what were the I lessons more, that have really- I have more, be- I have more beard now. <laughs> there you go. That's it. That's all there is. That's how I've changed. <laughs> yeah. I have thicker beard. Uh, wow. It's, it's again, you know, the coach that drafted me to Columbus, Ziggy Schmidt, uh, may his soul rest in peace. One of the greatest coaches in American soccer. I grew up in, in Southern California and played against his kids in high school. Mm-hmm. And when he was coaching at Los Angeles Galaxy, I used to, I, I played at Cal State Dominguez Hills, which is the, the college where the Galaxy Stadium is built. And I chose that college because at that time they were building the stadium. Mm-hmm. And I said, that's the motivation. So I would go around it, run around it. And then I ended up starting working at the stadium, you know, for the Galaxy and events planning. And uh, I would see Ziggy all the time. So he kind of knew my face a little while after playing against his kids. So every once in a while he said, hey, can you come train with the Galaxy? So here's the kid just working um, at the stadium and then training there and playing college on the side. And then he moved to Columbus Crew and he drafted me to Columbus Crew. And it was just like, I mean, it's, it was a dream really because it's one of the things you see in a movie. You know, mm-hmm. you work and then you play. But being at Columbus, you know, I was just young and bubbly and so happy and just thinking, you know it all. You know, I was coming from college scoring 16 plus goals a season. So I thought I was, you know, I was hot stuff and coming into Columbus. But I played a lot of games and I didn't score. I played two seasons there, a lot of games, probably scored five goals. Not probably, I scored five goals in both seasons. But it was a learning stage for me because I learned a lot over there. And being that young and the players that was amongst me, that's when I started realizing after my second year that, okay, I'm not as good as I think. Now it's time to, you know, put my foot down and start to learn. Yeah. And were, were you a good listener from day one? Like you come in and again, you, you have the swagger of college. You think, Oh, I'm going to just bang them in. Like, did you just come in? I'm going to do it my own way. Or were you a good listener from day one and wanted to take lessons? Like, how was that for you? And that's, and that's the point. And that's definitely it right there. Because yes, when I did come in, you know, I had the swagger on me that I can play, I can play, but at the same time I was listening. And then after my second year is when I realized, okay, yeah, everything that they've told me, you know, you're fast, you're this, but, You know, you don't have composure. You don't have the technique yet. Um, Obviously, and I looked at, you know, my youth career to know that, okay, yes, I don't have the technique. I don't know how to, you know, hit a ball this way. Mm -hmm. Um, So definitely, then I started every information that I got from these guys in Columbus. Then I moved to San Jose. And as I was going through those processes, when I started to take that information to the next training ground and started to implement it, you know, San Jose was a short state and I moved to Houston. Now that's when I finally started to come out. I was like, okay, some things that Ziggy was saying to me and then some of the players around me that I was listening to, I'm finally seeing it to come out. And that was when I was what, 23, almost 24. You know, it's a bit late when you look at soccer here in North America and how late people get to go to pro. But at the mm-hmm. same time, the things that I listened to before was able to uh, put me in that position to finally uh, be able to release it. Right. Yeah. And then you've had an opportunity, obviously, to be in a, a bunch of different groups, right? In different cities. Yeah. And, and so beyond just Ziggy, like, is there individuals who stand out who either they had really incredible compassion or they were just, they were naturally mentors? And yeah. Who were some of those guys and kind of what yeah. made them special? Yeah. Oh my God. I've been, I've been so many teams, so many countries and cities and so yeah. many guys, uh, you know, you don't want to hurt no feelings. <laughs> and people are like, Hey, what? I didn't mention you. What? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, different places have different people. You know, Ziggy was definitely one there, but I lived with a guy when I played in Columbus, Ezra Hendrickson, who then ended up coaching with Ziggy at Seattle. And now he's at Columbus again, coaching over there. That was mm-hmm. definitely one of my earlier men- mentors that, you know, I could just look and learn from, you know, we had the same kind of built, very tall and lanky and just like throwing our bodies all over the place. And they would just tell me how to take care of myself. So that was really good. The next, you know, round of uh, people that I have, I had Frank Yallop in, in San Jose, who's a very chill coach, 
you know, but then it does talk to you and gives you like, you know, the, the important information that you need to know. He didn't come to you and talk soccer all the time. But when I moved to Houston, that's when I felt like, again, everything that I've learned from Columbus and, and, uh, and, and uh, San Jose started to change because now I was playing with a championship team uh, caliber players in this mm -hmm. place, you know, Dwayne De Osario, obviously, who's, you know, a Canadian legend, that's one, and Brian Ching, and then being there, and what my striker coach was John Spencer, you know, that's definitely somebody that stood out to me and will always will. John Spencer played for Chelsea, you know, played here in Colorado, actually, mm -hmm. and he then started just telling me, like, Kai, you're so athletic, you're so powerful, this is what you need to do in your game to make sure that you're so dominant, you know, in the positions that you want to be. So I really count on him a lot as a mentor that the things that he gave me, the information that he passed on to me did help me go on and on to, you know, Kansas city and to England and all those places. Yeah. And what about, you know, thinking about all the things that are important to you now that are off the pitch, were there guys who, kind of influenced that as well, just in regards to who they were as people and what they focused on and what they cared about? That one's tough. Yeah, I, I, as you say that, I'm thinking, I'm like, no, it's, for me, it's, it, it comes from my upbringing, you know, mm -hmm. like being in Sierra Leone and my family was so close and we went through the civil war and, and I got lucky to come, you know, come out of that and lucky to move to the U.S. and lucky to play you know, sports in, in the U.S. and lucky to go to college and now I'm drafted. So that bubble, that happiness was always part of me. And so on the field, I was there. Off the field, all I wanted to do is just continue to be happy and spread that to the rest of the people. But at the same time, I knew what my, my goals were. I knew what I wanted. So to take care of my body and make sure, you know, I'm getting the right sleep, I knew how to control that. And obviously food wise, <laughs> Just being African and being, you know, the same foods that we eat all the time, I felt like, right. you know, that diet kind of just stuck with me and I was able to maintain that and, you know, not being able to, 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 to put myself in a, in a, in a position when I'm not able to control my body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, it's, and you talk about kind of those first moments, well, like when it was going off to college, it was, yeah. there was a real purpose around you know you weren't going to be able to pay for it you needed to find another way at it obviously when you arrived at columbus for the first time you know it was just focused on the game you know and now you have a family and everything's changed over the last 15 years like how's your how's your why and your purpose changed now like based on you know a decade ago till today like what's it all wow. about yeah um it's, it's, as we were talking, one of them is screaming up there. <laughs> Mommy, mommy's got it. Mommy's got right. it. Um, everything changes when you start having a family, you know, everything changes. And I've, I've, I played with guys before that had families and to see how they carry themselves, to see when their kids come into the dressing room, locker room or on the field, you know, I always admired it, but I didn't really know what it felt like until, you know, I had my first and, started moving forward with that you know it's yes I had the motivations of the things that I took back from Sierra Leone definitely has pushed me to where I'm, I'm at today but now that when you have a family of your own then the, your sacrifices and everything just goes amps up a little bit more and I go out there for training I go out there for games I go out there just as human and taking care of myself and knowing the fact that I'm not just doing it for me but I'm, rep I'm representing my family now. You know, it's, it's funny, but even when we walk around the neighborhood and there's these little kids in the different houses are going, Kai Kumar, Kai Kumar. And my daughter, Kieran, will go, Kai Kumar, Kai. So now <laughs> she even calls me Kai Kumar mm -hmm. just to joke around. Yeah. But when I see that and it makes me so happy and then she sees that and I'm like, there's nothing you can be but just be a good role model for your kids. You know, so that's my motivation. I have a four months old and mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, maybe I can play three more years to make sure she's three and be able to see me play a little right. bit more to comprehend it. Yeah. 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 No. And it's interesting when you talk about all the pieces too, it seems like you do a really nice job of um, putting it into chunks and keeping everything small. Cause when you talk about whether it's off the pitch or yes. what you're doing in training or your diet, um, cause we talked about luck a little bit off the top, like yeah. how do you keep that on track? Like if we were to, 
kind of talk about young players and what do they, how do they do that? Cause everybody sees, I always talk about, everyone sees social media and everybody's all demonstrative and telling all their stories and they think everybody's a star, yeah. but you can't be a star unless you do the work and, and no. what that takes behind. And that doesn't they seem don't. to make it onto Instagram as much. And so like, how do you, what's the lesson for young players and kids developing? I think you've said it there. You can't make it, you can't be a star unless you put in the work, you know, it's, yeah. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a believer of uh, hard work beats talent. That's what I'm a believer of. I'm not that talented player personally. And uh, I, but I work so hard and again, to be able to play the game at the age of 35 now, and I still look at myself to keep playing again. It's when you're younger, it's the sacrifices that you make, you know, make the good sacrifices as, as a young person, you know, meaning this, meaning, you know, your bedtime, your homework, your, you know, again, your diet, it's a habit where you start with that to know how you'll be able to control it later on. You know, sometimes, yeah, we want to play, 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 play. It's good. You know, play is good, but you're going to have to be able to balance the play into what works you want to do. For example, like me personally, mm -hmm. I'm, I, you know, it's, it's hard to really explain to people, but I don't know where it came from, but to me to be able to put my focus and say, I'm in high school, I go to school, obviously my mom goes to work from four to 2 a.m. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to school, what I'm doing is, I'm in school, after school's done, I stay in school, I play whether it was volleyball or track or, or soccer, but right when I get home, by seven o'clock, you know, I'm doing my homework, seven to nine, nine o'clock I'm going to sleep. And nobody trained me to do this. I just right. end up training myself after a year and two, I was like, I like this. And that just kept my focus. I'm able to keep my grades. So when I went to college, it was easier when they said, hey, you need this grade to be able to play in the college team. So mm -hmm. it was just like, okay. I said, yeah, that's definitely the same things I was doing. If I can do the same things here, whatever we do in school, I come back. I take that two hours off my day for sure to make sure I'm doing my work and doing that. So that balance, I was able to do that to it. Again, like I said, Diet wise, it was just you know, thanks to my mom that was making food for me all the time. But uh, yeah. but when it comes to being a person and being able to to balance these things, and that's how I looked at it. So when I was going for training, you know, I train, I go for runs, I make sure I have the time. So it's that little bit of a second that you have when you're younger, when we're home watching TV, social media, or or you know playing video games. Can you have that little bit that just kicks into you every once in a while? which still does. I still feel like a kid. I'm sitting there. I'm like, you know what? I'm going for a run. And I'll just get up and go for a run. You know? Right. So when you have those things and make those little sacrifices, hopefully it's going to get you to where you're supposed to go to. Yeah. So what flips that switch? So that moment you're doing something and all of a sudden you're going to go like, what, where's that, where does that come from? It's, it's a mentality thing. It's a mentality thing that people say, they've always said, they say, you know, your mind is stronger, you know, than your body, than everything. Sure. And I don't know why I picked that up so young. Cause I'll be sitting there even say, I want to do sit-ups or push-ups. And I go, they always say you were sitting there. All it takes is that moment of saying, okay, I'm going to get up. Can you do that? If you do that, you're going to be able to do, you know, anything that you say you're going to do. Mm -hmm. So I'll be there. I'll be there. And I, I'm so, you know, blessed to say I have that power when I'm there. I go, you know what? Yep. Get up. And yeah. why, when I take that step to get up, it's going to take me to, you know, where I want to go to. Yeah. Well, it's just choices, right? It's just making good choices and uh, making good choices. Definitely making good choices, good sacrifices. And that's what it is. It's the parties you're going to miss, the birthday parties, the weddings, the, you know, I need to go hang out with my friends. We need to go to this movie and all these things. I missed a lot of those, but they will come later on. You're going to have time when you're able to do it, but yeah. you have to make those sacrifices and decide what you want. It's not just about sports, you know, anything. It's like what you want, what sacrifices are you willing to make before you can get that? Yeah. And, and it's funny on the academic side, like, was that, was there any routine or habit built in from time in Sierra Leone around how study works and how school works? No. Yeah. No. no, no. Okay. Because I, I miss, I miss me and anybody else around my age group missed so much school during the civil war. Mm -hmm. You know, it was fun because we didn't go to school. Just like now our kids are home and thinking, you know, pandemic is going on. Yeah, There's no school to display yeah, yeah. all day. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, yeah. but that's what it was. I missed so much school in Sierra Leone during the Civil War. Went to school, but I don't, 
I don't really think school was that much of a focus, you know, but the mm -hmm. academic side, that athletic side did push me a bit to the academic side because mm -hmm. growing up in LA and growing up in the neighborhood that I grew up in wasn't the best. Yeah. So I didn't want to go home. I just want, cause my mom is not home. If I go home, it's just me. Right. And that can put me in trouble with the rest of the people in my neighborhood. Cause they come and knock on my door. Like, Kai, let's go, let's go outside. So yeah. I stayed in school, stayed there. So the sports, you know, soccer and all the other sports I play, period, pushed me because now I had to get my grades to stay in the sports, you know, yeah. and then, you know, staying in the sports, then my grades. So the balance of those, those two things just actually just ended up just uh, really balancing and working out perfectly for me. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. Yeah. Cause I, and the reason I ask is because, because there's obviously a lot of challenges with some of the, some of what's delivered academically where we work yeah. in East Africa and, but one of the things that's fascinating is there is study time and structure around prep, they call it, in the evenings where there's just hours and time set aside as a habit. And you don't want to be in a habit where you're just sitting there for the sake of sitting there. But the fact that you are doing it every day, that it's part of the routine, that, well, if I'm here, I might as well get something done. Yeah. Um, there is some really great things to that. Um, and I know some of our kids, they carry that with them. Um, yeah. So it's, it's just, it's, often easy to vilify what's delivered academically, you know, in places yeah. we work, but there are also some gifts there too, that you could take with you. But. I think, I think too, it's, it's making, it's making school fun. Making school fun does For help sure. you really uh, comprehend and study and, and, and do some good things, you know, yeah. um, I'm going to say in West Africa, in Sierra Leone, you know, school was tough. The yeah. times we went to schools, you know, the times you missed homeworks and times, you know, the teachers, you know, give you a spanking on your butt and mm -hmm. all these things and everything yeah. you felt like it was so stressful to do, do, do. But the opportunities that we do have in these parts of the world, you know, it's the research on the computer, you know, the school projects that's, you know, fun. I remember one of my favorite things to do in school was PowerPoint presentations. Mm -hmm. I used to love those because they're just so creative. Even though I'm doing all these research and getting information from things that I have to do, but at the same time, to be able to design things and then launch it to the class, yeah. I used to love that. But right. us not having, you know, most schools in Africa, not having those kind of um, accessibility to things, you know, it's, it's tough. But hopefully, you know, people or teachers and, 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 and governments out there are able to implement some different ways that you can also be able to make education fun, you know, for, for some sure. of the kids. So it's not just more stressful. Yeah. Well, and keep arts going and keep people, kids creative, you know, yes. which is, you know, why you're in your acting classes, right? Playing on something. My acting classes. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Definitely. I mean, I'm going to be creative, just open my mind up a little bit more, but I mean, yeah, I have three kids and the kind of things that they do and they tell them from school. I'm like, uh, the other day, my, my boy Kendrick, they're like, Oh, get some things. We're going to drop in water, see what, what floats and what sink. And I'm like, I don't remember doing that as a kid. So yeah. now he's in the bath and he tells me, daddy, this floats, daddy, <laughs> this sink. I was like, you see, so you started to get these things. It's so fun. Yeah. It's amazing. And it's, yeah. it's funny. So then on the younger players and kind of younger others that you've worked with, there were lots of stories um, about you and your relationship with Alfonso Davies and your time in Vancouver. I'd be interested. He's my, fourth. To... He's my fourth kid. There you go. Yeah. Like, <laughs> talk to me about that kind of relationship and that that was that your first real did that feel like a first real mentor opportunity and kind of what were you trying to impart or like what was that about uh, I I I'm blessed to really you know get as much credit as I'm getting for Alfonso because <laughs> the kid was just talented on his own you know yeah. he's really talented but it's again it's going back to Columbus to Ziggy Schmidt Ezra Hendrickson um, you know um, John Spencer and I'm a young guy, but they were willing to take their time to mentor me because they could see that I was listening to what they were saying. Mm. And that's what clicked with me on Alfonso Davis when I first went to Vancouver. It was like, I can see this kid, you know, I see myself in him, wants to have fun, wants to enjoy the game. At the same time, he listens so well, you know, and he's, he's a sponge. He sucks it all in, and when it's time to squeeze it, he just squeezes it out. Uh, we clicked. We clicked well. I think also the having African backgrounds did help mm -hmm. a lot. Um, his parents being from Liberia and, you know, he being in Ghana and being a refugee also. So we clicked in so much, you know, sense. And we, again, both had the opportunity. He's in Canada. I'm in America. But 
people around us gave us so much belief to show that, you know, you have the talent, you can do it. They kept pushing us. So when I was in Vancouver with, with, with Alfonso, it was just, I mean, I just, I'm a fun guy. And mm-hmm. I can see that he was scared to have fun. You know, he was really just wanted to play more and does what everybody expected from him because they're like, oh, this phenomenon player coming up. But I was like, you know, try to have fun while you're doing it. You know, I'm going to go back to Ziggy. Um, Ziggy once said to us, he's like, you kids think soccer is just fun, 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 fun. You know, and then adults might think it's just serious, serious, because you have family, you got to provide for them this. It's like, no, it's neither one of those. They say soccer is not just too serious. Soccer is not just fun. Soccer is serious fun. It's like, Mm -hmm. can you control that too, you know, to make it serious fun? They say, well, you can do that. So I kind of told them those things, say, Let's make soccer serious fun. When it was business time, we're at the stadium. I look around and say, hey, this stadium is back. Today, we're going to make sure they enjoy it. We're going to take it serious, but they're going to have fun watching us and stuff like that. And that just consistency was one of the first things, actually, I did say, Miss, to, to be, to be uh, successful, you got to be consistent into whatever you're doing. It's not just having one game, um, you know. Again, it's, it's not just about passing one class. Like, you got to consistently make sure you're doing these things. So I say if you can consistently play five games, the same level you're playing those games. And then from there, let's go to eight games. And then from there, let's go to this. So mm-hmm. those things I used to learn from other people, it was so easy to tell them because when you told, uh, when you told Fonzie, he could listen. And then you can see the growth and how he was going. Yeah. But again, a lot of credit to all the people that he was with earlier before me. I only spent one year, but mm-hmm. the credits that I'm getting, I'm blessed for it. <laughs> right, yeah. No, it's amazing. And uh, there's some really great lessons in there. Like, I think the one thing around the listing, I think is interesting. Like, you can be around a lot of amazing mentors and you could be a lot around a lot of great people. But if you're not leaning in and kind yeah. of having some physical cues that you want to learn and listen, like, that's when people are going to be willing to share. You can't just expect them to chase you down. And it's interesting no, yeah, to hear, some, yeah. kids, some kids are shy. Some kids yeah. are really shy, which, again, your upbringing does kind of push you into that. And shy players or shy people are not going to make it like that. You might get lucky again, mm-hmm. you know, but it's okay to be open. It's funny when they always tell us there's no, you know, question as a dumb question, yeah. but there really isn't. And if you're young as a player or as a person, you you can ask questions. You keep asking that question. Even if that person says, oh, kind of dumb question is that at this at the end of that he's going to give you an answer and then at the end of that you you know the answer to that question you just ask that person so yeah. you know for the younger people that's that's shy and going through that you know hopefully you do find the right mentors around you that's not going to push you too hard but now again we're in the in the time of where we want everybody to listen everyone to listen to us so when someone is listening you know uh find someone that's going to listen to what you're going to ask about and hopefully they can translate those things to you in the right way. Yeah. And is it, do you feel like, is there an element, like it'd be interesting, like some of the young players now that are coming in, um, has it changed where are there, there's a, I don't want to say desperation, but a need to be cool and be accepted before being fun and joyful or like what, how does that feel today? And yeah. Society. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Social media. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I don't know, fashion and all these things, you know, does play a role, but I'm definitely a, a, a swagger person. I'm, I'm a fashion person. I'm a fun person and take all those things. But yeah. again, as you said earlier, you know, you got to work. If you want to be someone, you got to work for it. So take all these things, do all these posts, watch Cristiano Ronaldo, you know, post pictures on Instagram. But at the same time, don't forget the days that he does post how hard he's working, you yeah. know. So we, we have to look at all these, you know, fun things and and getting don't get sidetracked by just, you know, the fun, the fashion, the you know, the swag of all these things. But knowing that you need to do something before you can achieve all that, you know. Yeah. And if you don't, you can't. One of my you know role models in sports, which wasn't really soccer in America, was not a soccer player. It's it's a football player, and that is, is uh, his name is Chad Ochocinco. Mm-hmm. I just love the the arrogancy that he had of his mm-hmm. game, and not just that because once he said, which stuck with me, I'm gonna talk so much crap to everybody else because I know they're coming after me, but that means I gotta work twice as hard 
because I don't want them to catch me. I don't want them to hit me, you know, and I want to get those touchdowns. I want to get this. So I looked at that. I was like, yeah, that's, that's right. I'm not training me and my teammates, me and my friends. I'm talking back to them, but I got to work twice as hard now because I don't want them to catch up to me, you know, into different ways. Because if I'm not doing well, I'm just going to talk. Then you're nothing, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. No, it's amazing. And, and it's, uh, Obviously, you can't do all the talking, but you obviously need to be a need to be a listener too. But yeah, yeah, and you got to back it up for sure. I think, yeah. and like allowing young players, especially, you know, so if that does happen or if that's the case, like, then even if you miss, you know, you're still doing incredible things. And even if you fall flat, so yeah. what? I think there's this myth too around how many people actually care or are paying attention, you know, and. Um, you know, that whole self-esteem and getting caught up and worrying about what everybody else thinks, you know, yeah. did you ever have moments of that? We're, we're going to make mistakes, you know, yeah. I mean, it's cliche when no one's perfect. Yeah. But seriously, it is, it's real, you know, where none yeah. of us are. If you have to juggle the ball, you know, I'm going to relate to soccer again. You have to juggle the ball. You're going to drop it at some point. It's going to happen. Or else you can just stand there for the next hundred years and juggle, yeah. you know, so we're going to make those mistakes. Yeah. And don't, don't, don't settle or oh, don't fall flat again and feel like you're just going to stay down there because it's going to happen. You know, I've yeah. fell flat a few times. I'm a soccer player. I'm, I'm a striker, which is the toughest position. Strikers and defenders and, and goalkeepers, you know, defenders slip. Goalkeepers, you know, ball goes in between their legs. Strikers, mm -hmm. I, I had the greatest miss in the miss history of soccer. And that could have been my, you know, downfall of all if I just stayed down there and put my head down. You know, I missed the ball in the in the in the in the goal line, which you know it went all around the world. I'm getting phone calls from places I never did, asking for interviews from Vietnam and all these places. And I'm like, this is cool. You know, that's how I'm like, this is cool. Wow. So now, if I score a goal, they're gonna see it again, and they're gonna think, oh, you remember that guy that missed? This is what he did. You yeah. know, but we can't. You know, it happens a lot again to my position, strikers and forwards. Because you miss a goal and then your team loses and then you put your head down, you know, but don't put your head down so much. Again, they say, you you know, you're going to fall, you're going to fall. At some point, you have to get up. You have to get up. These are all cliche. These are all quotes that you see a lot and you don't really think about it. But you got to put those things in your head because none of us are made to have the most perfect career or life or anything that's going on. You're going to make those mistakes. And if you don't make those mistakes, you know, what else is going to make you stronger? Just by people telling you that you're the best? Yeah. It's not, you know? Yeah, yeah. you got to take action, right, and do something. And, uh, and that's what, on that, too, I'd like to switch a little bit. Um, 2015, um, uh -huh. MLS Humanitarian of the Year um, Award. Maybe tell me a bit about that and tell me about giving back to the community and yeah. what you're trying to do and kind of why that's so important. Yeah, again, like I said, you know, I got lucky to be here today. I got lucky to, you know, for us to have the platform to be speaking. And uh, that luck is what, you know, I'm using that blessing to give, give back. And it's not a job to me. It's just part of me. You know, I was born and raised in Sierra Leone Civil War. Got lucky to be here. So it's like, why not make somebody else that's watching or seeing you on television, man, why not make them happy? When somebody calls me and say, hey, Kai, there's an appearance today. For these kids in this neighborhood, all I say is yes, I'm there, and I'm always there, you know. And yes, getting the humanitarian uh, award, it's it's cool, but I've always said uh, I'm not doing it for the awards, you know. If sure. I was, then you know, every year I'll be trying to say, okay, let's do some more this year so we can get no, you know, <laughs> I'm doing the stuff that comes and it's so natural that I can do. During that year, uh, we were able to build a school in Sierra Leone uh, mm -hmm. with a program called Schools for Salon, which is amazing. We've been working with them for a while. Or 2015 again I came back to the US and uh, from England and we had a good season in Columbus and at the same time be able to do that and put school in Sierra Leone that was like my World Cup you know it was you know a championship so and I go back there I do so much more but it's nice when people recognize it hit more over here because it does give the kids back home more opportunities for success because now they're seeing what you're doing in those countries and hopefully, you know, more people pay attention and hopefully even give back, not just me giving back my time to make sure that I'm lighting up some kids' day, but, you know, some people financially that can give back, you know, to make sure that there's school, you know, there's a soccer field, there's a soccer ball, there's soccer shoes or pens or books, 
for those kids, you know, and hopefully it, uh, it, it continues to grow. Yeah. Yeah. And it's about providing hope, right? And it's, yep. you know, and it's um, whether it's Sierra Leone or back where you are now in the U S yeah. like, um, I've, and I wanted, I wanted to ask you a little bit too. Like I know I saw on social media that you, um, you had your family out at the protests and everything that's happening right now around racial injustice. Curious if you have hope there and kind of how that's resonated with you. Yes, I have hope. That's a big word, hope. And I have hope. I have hope. The reason why I have hope for all this, because it's not black people that's out there protesting. That's why Mm -hmm. I have hope because it's, it's, the others that does feel the pain of what most of us have felt or the you know discrimination or the situations that most of us have been in and it's finally uh people have sat down you know thanks to corona in in your house and watch these videos and say you know what yeah we feel this pain with the rest of everyone so let's be out there let's stand up together let's try to make a change so i do feel hope um i wanted to take my kids out there even though it's so hard for them to comprehend but sure. I wanted to take my kids and just, you know, I tell my daughter, she asked, Daddy, what's this? I go, oh, everybody's fighting to make sure everybody loves everybody. That's mm-hmm. the only thing I can explain to her. You know, sure. I'm not able. My son does repeat. You know, again, we laid on the floor and saying, I can't breathe. It came home. He did it again. You know, we're in the room the other day after your bath two days ago. He's like, Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. I'm like, you're three years old, <laughs> you know, but I can't explain to him to tell him what it means. But. You know, in this in this world, um, Adrian, and we we're all trying to give back, which is good. But at the same time, the the color of our skin should not matter anymore. You know, we've gotten yeah. past that. You know, it's just one one heart bleed the same, and all this. But it's and in me, it's not really about me. It's my kids. I want to make sure that the the movements that I've been in, that when they grow up, they don't have to think about that. They can have other difficulties in life, but. I just don't want them to think about it because their mentality, their minds might not be as strong as mine. Mm-hmm. And hopefully yeah, that they don't have to think about that. So that's the hope. Yeah. And what do you, what do you think, what do you think needs to happen so that we don't lose this moment or this momentum? Cause these things have happened before and you know, it kind of go like what needs to happen or change. Sorry. I, I thought I lost you for a bit. Yeah. Yeah. What needs to happen? What needs to change? Again, uh, people are listening. People are listening right now, which is the most important thing is listening. And hopefully the world, the world has listened, but hopefully our country as the United States of America, again, I'm sorry, you're in Canada, but I feel like the U.S. is the most powerful nation in the world, mm-hmm. um, has to listen. You know, yes, we've gone through, you know, many other things before. Me, I am even blessed and thankful to the people that fought for us before to be able to Im- immigrate to this country because mm-hmm. it wouldn't have happened. You know, yeah. I immigrated here as a refugee, as a Muslim refugee, immigrated mm-hmm. here, and now I'm a citizen of this country. So it's so powerful. But again, I want to see that power change so that, you know, it's not just about me being a citizen, but also having equal rights as, you know, as the rest. And yeah. uh, I think the, the fact that most people are listening and most people are standing together and the world and people from different places are standing for this cause, man, I'll be shocked to see if nothing changes here. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it, it's even like, it's, it's fascinating even for, for me, cause I've been working in Uganda and East Africa since 2005 Yes. and everybody would see the stuff that we're doing and would always say, well, you know, clearly, you know, you guys are doing so much that you can to level the play field and provide opportunities. And even in this moment, like, I feel like we've been focused on being fair and being equitable. But I think the thing I've learned through all this, I'm not sure that means any of those things mean justice. And I think, and that's how we start to look at it. Like, and I think for us, how are we really intentional about providing opportunities and not just saying we're trying. And I think that's what's happened before. It's let's try to do this. Let's try to do that. How can we commit to something and then be accountable when we don't do that? And I think, you know, that's how we've started to, or yeah. I've started to think about it differently. And um, I think you're right. It's timing the pandemic and everybody yeah. is holed up and every, this was just, you know, it exploded on all of us in one moment. And I hope we don't yeah. lose it because it's been really no. impactful for me. And I think we're going to be more intentional going forward. And I hope, you know, obviously a lot more people are too. I hope we don't. I hope we don't. And that's you yeah. mentioned too. Yeah. People say to me all the time, well, uh, 
there's many, you know, police brutality in Africa, Africa in general, this, 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 yeah. you know, what are you going to do about that? What are you going to say about that? Because, you know, you're uh, an idol around Africa. Like, why don't you say something? I go <laughs> again, the U S is such a powerful country. If the U S can make a change, that change, I believe would trigger down to different places around the world. Sure. You know, again, this police brutality against blacks is not just in the U S you know, I've traveled mm -hmm. the world, I've been around the world and I've seen it, you know? So if, but if this can happen here again, slavery did have the time that it ended. And the, if, you know, we can have Barack Obama as the first black president and they gave hope to so many other black people around the world period. Yeah. And if this can change, which hopefully I think I've seen some stuff going on the news, some bills have been, you know, changed and all this, that can trigger down to, you know, some other places. And hopefully it's tough, but that world peace, it hopefully will come one day. And Africa, I mean, that continent will be a continent that will really benefit from something like that. For sure. Yeah. Well, it is. And it's great to see you bring your kids out. And like, there's so many young people too, with incredible energy and new ideas about this too. And so there's, yeah, there's lots to be excited yeah. oh, about. Yeah, we met, we met, yeah. you know, in the side note, we met a, 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 a family, you know, another family out there at this place. That's who's coming today and playing with my kids. You know, people yeah. connect in different ways. Mm. It's not, the kids don't see anything else. No. And if they don't, we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't let our egos and our, you know, whatever, experiences that we've had to block ways for people that's younger than us and yourself going back to Africa or a place that's not where you were born, but you're working mm -hmm. so much and to give it back to you, giving hope to kids and ju just for them to dream that, yeah, I can do that. That is so, oh man, it's so powerful that yeah. you can do something like that. So it's great. Yeah, no, agreed. I think, and you do that as well, incredibly well. I think it is, we can do everything we can to support and, and give back to projects, but it is really important to have, you know, whether it's somebody like you who's had the success you've had and, or whether it's some of the scholars out of uh, academies all over the continent who end up in the US or Canada or in the NCAA, like we need to have those kids make it for kids at, you know, at home in wherever yes. that might be for them to believe it's possible, right? It's one yes. thing to talk about it. Um, yes. But it's, yeah, and I think you're, you're a shining example of that, which is... And I think uh, they will. Yeah. I think they will, yeah. I believe in the educational system so much, so strong that we shouldn't have a goal in our head to say, I'm going overseas to go become a professional athlete. You know, mm -hmm. then when you believe, again, like you said, the NCAA or, you know, in Canada, when you believe that there's a system, there is a system out there. And when that system is the educational system, you go through that system, something will come from it. Again, if you don't become a professional athlete, that's okay. But you can still be some kind of a community, you know, and, and make an uh, impact in your community or a leader or something that you can go back to Africa, like you say, and then you'll be like, yes, I went to the uh, overseas in this program. I got my education. And look at me now. I'm head of agriculture. I'm, I have my own farm and those things. So it could be, yeah. it could be possible. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, okay. Before we wrap up, um, so at the end of every pod, yeah. Um, I do this section called three quips for our kids. So what I'm going to do, so I want you to pretend you're a teenager again. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's and far back. But okay. So, so maybe let's put it this way. You've got your teenage self sitting in the room uh -huh. and you're going to give yourself advice to these three questions. So you're, you're sitting next to, let's say 14 year old Kai. Yeah. Let's make it 16. Cause we just came to the U S just arrived. 14. 14. Okay. I might've not known what's going on. Right, yeah, you might not be listening. Okay. No <laughs> yeah. problem. So, so I'm going to say, so first, mm -hmm. um, you're going to say to Kai, do this at the start of every day. What should that be? Knowing what you know now, what would you tell 16 year old Kai to do at the start of every single day? Kai, <laughs> pray at the start of every day. Mm. Okay. Amazing. Great. Um, yeah, everything, you know, that, that all that links to around gratitude and meditation yeah. and trying to, yeah, not pick up the phone. That Which was good. I do. good Which answer. I do every yeah, year. Yeah. Yeah. I've always, yeah. But it's good. You know, when you leave, before you leave in the house, you know what you're going for. For sure. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Number two. So you, so you get uh, young Kai can take one trip anywhere in the world. 
where would you tell him to go and why? Kai, young Kai. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Kai, you're taking the one trip. You go back to Africa. Mm. You go back home. That's your okay. one trip okay. because that trip is going to wake you up and show you the road to life. Okay. Amazing. Super. Okay. Last one. Kai, don't listen to this advice. Oh my God. What did somebody <laughs> tell you that you like, I should not listen to this. This is, this was bad advice I got. Don't, don't listen. I didn't listen to it, but I'm going to say again, Kai, don't listen to people back in Africa telling you change your age so you can be young. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I've heard that before. We're not going to get into that. We're out of time, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I heard yeah. that so much. I'm like, oh, man, you could, you could be playing in for Barcelona, blah, blah, blah. Why did you do that? I was like, I, I grew up in America, guys. Stop this, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. We can, we can share a lot of stories, but uh, we'll, leave it, we'll leave it at that. Um, yeah. So thanks so much. I know you're having busy Thank days, you, Mitch. And uh, yeah, well, I'd love to be able to do this again sometime soon. So thanks course, again. Yeah, thank you. Definitely. Thank you very much again. Yeah, we'll definitely do it again. Super. Thanks.